you should you should have or, or should be getting a, a an outline that I put together of it. I condensed it's forty pages down to two. <laughs> um, but I, I hope that you'll actually read the whole thing. Um, you can find you just Google it just by name. You'll find a PDF. There's several places I, I think have it available. There's also though there's another one that's in our uh, foyer. Uh, J.C. Ryle's A Call to Prayer. Have any of you seen it or read it? Some of you? Yes? Okay. So, uh, I recommend it too. It, it's very uh, helpful. And I actually wanted to start here. Um, both of these writers, one of the main points that they... Uh, bring to us and and in their discussions and meditations on prayer is that it is the they they both use the phrase secret of holiness and I wanted to share with you what what J C Ryle said about it uh, just as a way of sort of setting the table. Um, about this topic of prayer. We're in our fourth week, I think, now of talking about prayer. And we could go on and on, but I think next week we're going to a new topic. Glory of God, okay. <laughs> so Ryle says, um, there are some of the Lord's people who seem never able to get on from their time of conversion. They are born again, but they remain babes all their lives. You hear from them the same old experience. You observe in them the same want of spiritual appetite, the same want of interest in anything beyond their own little circle that you observed 10 years ago. They are pilgrims indeed, but pilgrims like the Gibeonites of old, their bread is always dry and moldy, their shoes always old, and their garments always rent and torn. I say this with sorrow and grief, but I ask any real Christian, is it not true? There are others of the Lord's people who seem to always be advancing. They grow like the grass after rain, they increase like Israel in Egypt, they press on like Gideon, though sometimes faint, yet always pursuing. They are ever adding grace to grace and faith to faith and strength to strength. Every time you meet them, their hearts seem larger, their spiritual stature taller and stronger. Every year, they appear to see more, know more, believe more, and feel more in their religion. They not only have good works, but prove the reality of their faith, good works to prove the reality of their faith, but they are zealous of them. They not only do well, but they are unwearied in well-doing. They attempt great things and they do great things. When they fail, they try again, and when they fall, they are soon up again. And then he goes on to say, the reason for the difference. I believe that those who are not eminently holy pray little, and those who are eminently holy pray much. So, why do we not pray much? Why do we not pray much? Well, it's not to say that we, not, not all of us, uh, many of us do pray much, I'm sure. Um, but uh, one of the, the first things that, that McIntyre addresses in his essay on the hidden life of prayer is um, uh, chapter one, item one, prayer is hard work. I thought it was interesting that, that he would start there. 
Um, you know, it does re it does require discipline and um, commitment and effort. It's. Uh, well, I think we all have the experience that it's it's easy to just sort of get swept away at the start of the day, um, which is normally when my principal time of prayer is, by whatever's happening. You know, the phone rings, uh, the doorbell rings, uh, something happens, and pretty soon, you know, an hour or two has passed, and you have not spent time in prayer. Um, uh, McIntyre says, in its nature it is a laborious undertaking and in your endeavor to maintain the spirit of prayer, in our endeavor to maintain the spirit of prayer, we are called to wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness. So, you know, it, it, right from the start, you know, the, part of the issue is that there is a spiritual warfare involved in being diligent in prayer. Um, if you can be uh, distracted, you're, you're fighting not only your own sluggishness and and doing this, uh, but real principalities and powers that don't want you to. Um, we don't see exactly how those work, uh, but the Bible tells us they're real and that we're we're hindered by them and so you know you have to consider that there is a real um, a battle in a sense that you're fighting just to make sure that you get time to pray to be in communion with God so it's hard work In uh, uh, there's a spiritual warfare aspect of it, and then you know, as I mentioned in, in the second part, he says we must be on guard against neglecting the gift of prayer through sluggishness. You know, I think part of the you know, in our fallen nature, the, the, the reality is that it's easy for us to convince ourselves that we'll be okay today if we don't pray. You know, we're, it's not like we're not, we're not going to be able to eat or breathe or, you know, make it to work if I neglect this duty. It's easy for us to think that way. Um, but it's not wise. We're, I need to silence this. We, we, we have to, you know, exercise ourselves to think of uh, our own weakness, um, our yeah, our sluggishness, our 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 sense of our independence. Um, the, you know, the reality is that you won't take the next breath, and you won't get the next meal, and you won't make it to work, apart from. God's protection and provision for you. So you are dependent, <laughs> uh, much more dependent than you're prone to think. Um, and this 
act of prayer in itself is an expression of that dependence. Um, so be on guard against your, your own sluggishness. In that section, McIntyre says, um, the only remedy for this sluggish mood is that we should rekindle our love. Let us ask for a fresh gift of the Holy Spirit to quicken our sluggish hearts, a new disclosure of the charity of God. The Spirit will help our infirmities and the very compassion of the Son of God will fall upon us, clothing us with zeal as with a garment, stirring our affections into a most vehement flame and filling our souls with heaven. I think Spurgeon made the same point in uh, chapter 9 of the book that we just finished, Spurgeon on the Christian Life, uh, you know, he said, if you're having trouble praying, pray. <laughs> um, pray and ask God to help you pray. Uh, prayer is continuous for the one who walks with God or waits upon him. Um, you know, I've talked with people in the past when... I, uh, D different situations, but um, I'll ask about, you know, how is, your, how is your quiet time with the Lord? How are your devotions? And when we talk specifically about prayer, it is often the case that, well, you know, I'm praying regularly and, you know, throughout the day, and, and um, uh, I feel like it's good. And you should do that. Uh, but look at what Matthew 6, 6 says. <laughs> when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. We'll, we'll get to that openly, reward you openly part later. But... Um, you know, there, there is a clear instruction here to take time to commune with God uh, apart from distractions, apart from, for me, the biggest challenge is my phone. Um, uh, either I need to start before, like, the office gets going, um, or wait until uh, you know I know that the office is going, and then I can just turn it off for a while. And, and um, but I can't have it on <laughs> because every time it dings, you know, it's there's something that I've got to stop, and you know, just a total distraction. Um, so there, there. It's important that. You make time to um, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father. Uh, and and not, not treat it casually. Uh, remember that the initial point of, of uh, you know, the secret of holiness. Uh, it's not really a secret. Um, We'll look at the ways that um, prayer changes us uh, as we go through this. But um, there's a there's a there's a part of it that it's like it's uh, it's almost undiscernible to you. Like I don't think we, you know, when we pray. Um, you spend a half an hour, an hour praying, and you know we don't. We we should come out of that feeling renewed and refreshed, um, but um, it's not like we can measurably, you know, tell that there's a, you know, an increased spiritual maturity that we 
you know, we've come out of the other side of that hour with. Um, but over time, that's what happens. Uh, that, that's the issue. The more you, you are going to God and communing with God, uh, the, the more you are being conformed to Christ. Slowly, different people, different speeds, but um, it is happening, even though you don't know it. Uh, other people will see it. Uh, other people will see your own um, sanctification, maybe, before you will. So, uh, you know, McIntyre makes the point that it's, it's continuous um, and it's as you go, but it also, as we're instructed uh, in the Word of God, needs to be deliberate, set apart, um, time with God. In the second chapter, he gets into the equipment, and he talks about a quiet place, a quiet hour, and a quiet heart. He wrote this in 1913, and when he talks about a quiet place, he talks about you know, the, all the distractions of traffic and um, you know, commotion and... That was a long time before we had as much traffic and commotion as we have now. <laughs> so before electronic media. So you have to, you have to plan it. You have to, uh, as McIntyre says, exercise some, some self-denial here. You have to... You have to make it, you know, you have to make a time and a place. You have to, you have to do this. You, you, you know, it's, um, it seems so basic, but, you know, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. You need a quiet place. And, you know, he, he writes at length about this, and at the end of the, that section he says, you know, if, if necessary, do as this poor woman that he had spoken with, she just threw an apron over her head and made for herself a quiet place. A quiet hour will be harder to find than a quiet place. Uh, again, uh, you know, it takes planning and forethought. Enter with deliberation as Christ did. Um, Paul Washer did a, 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 I guess you'd say, I don't know if it was a sermon or a lecture, uh, either way, we, we spent one of our small group nights watching it. And the, the, the whole focus of his um, hour talk was the example of Christ and his diligence in prayer. And, you know, this, the difficulty that, he had in, with the, the mobs and the throngs and the people pressing in all the time, you know, wanting a part of him. Um, and he, he always made time, no matter how uh, tired or, you know, how um, exhausted, what the circumstances were. Uh, he, he, made, he made time, he made, he found a quiet place and, um, and a quiet hour. And McIntyre's advice on, you know, when is the best time, um, it's some people it's morning, some it's midday, some it's evening, some can do all three. Um, but uh, McIntyre's point is give your best to God. My best is in the morning. I, I, I think more clearly. I'm able to, f once I've had at least one cup of coffee, um, be more focused, less distracted, um, and 
So my time is early in the day. A quiet heart, he says, will be harder. Um, and he quotes John Bunyan. Let me see if I can find that quote. I put some page numbers in here so that I could find these quotes, but, but standing in front of all of you and looking for them is different. Um, Bunyan, let's see, that is um, a quiet heart. Bunyan remarks from his own deep experience, Oh, the starting holes that the heart hath in the time of prayer. None knows how many byways the heart hath and back lanes to slip away from the presence of God. I mean, I, I, I certainly have that experience. That, you know, even when I am all alone, when the phone is off, um, and I am trying to pray, I am, I just feel like, you know, all these things are happening in my head that are trying to derail me. And I have to, I, I, you know, I have to stop and pray and ask God to just help me focus on what I'm trying to pray about. Um, it's a struggle. Um, but so, so he gives some advice about how to, uh, how to quiet, quieten, I get quiet, quiet your heart. Um, and he says, recognize our acceptance before God as a privilege possible only by the blood of Christ. I don't think that's something that we think about, uh, 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 you know, I guess I should say, I don't think about it enough. I don't know how you all think. Um, but to be reminded every time I pray, Father in heaven, that the only reason I have that privilege and that access is because of what Christ has done, because of the blood of Christ. Um, do you stop and think about that when you're when you're when you're about to pray? Um, that this this privilege is entirely um, made possible by Christ. That will help. That'll help quiet your heart. And another uh, uh, way in which we can um, quiet our hearts in um, a, a time of secret devotion, um, McIntyre says, receive the enabling grace of the Spirit. And so it is the Spirit of God dwelling in us um, who applied redemption to us who uh, works even this desire to pray in us um, receive the enabling grace of the spirit so your your uh, your, your time and prayer if the Spirit of God is working, uh, uh, to, uh, you, you don't even know how to pray apart from what the Spirit of God is doing in you. And when you do pray, you don't do it well. Um, and the, but the Spirit of God is, is, is working to 
uh, on your behalf, inter, you know, uh, um, making sense of what your needs are to Christ who is then interceding for you. Um, and then the other uh, piece of advice here is direct our hearts toward the Holy Scriptures as a means of helping calm a contrary mind. And McIntyre um, quotes uh, George Mueller. I think I mentioned him last time. You've probably heard of him. If you haven't read his autobiography, you should. It's quite a testimony. Um, but, you know, he struggled in the same way. And here's this, like, with this great example of a praying life for us um, who struggled to have a quiet heart before God. And what he did was he started by reading Scripture and meditating on Scripture to get his mind right so that he could um, focus on prayer. Um, George Mueller confessed that often he could not pray until he had steadied his mind upon a text. It is not the prerogative of God. Is it not the prerogative of God to break the silence? When thou sayest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Psalm 27, 8. Is it not fitting that his will should order all the acts of our prayer with himself? Um, so that's the equipment. Quiet place, quiet hour, quiet heart. Um, chapter 3, the direction of the mind. Um, here, McIntyre talks about realizing the presence of God. And... And I tried to look up, so he, he quotes, I don't know, like, I didn't count them, but probably 50 or 60 people uh, who, have, who have had wise things to say about prayer. Um, but in this section, he quotes Brother Lawrence, who apparently was a Catholic monk. So I inserted my own little editorial remark there. Um, I think... So this, there, um, we don't want to cross over into mysticism here. That's not what we're recommending. But, uh, you know, one of the things that really changed my prayer life um, was when I studied and thought and meditated on our union with Christ. And, um, you know, the, the way in which um, we, we have a shared life with Christ. Christ shares his life with us. Um, we are indwelled by the Spirit, but um, I think it's John 14, 21, it speaks about... Um, we will come and dwell with you and manifest ourselves to you. So, um, your union with Christ, uh, even I, I think it's fair to say, is connected with the way that you were created in the image of God. Um, you were created, so the Father and the Son, there's a mutual indwelling. You were created with the capacity for God to dwell in you. So as, uh, there is a sense in which that is part of the way in which you are created in the image of God. You're created with this capacity for God to dwell in you. And if you're regenerate, if you're Christian, that is the reality. And uh, it's just mind-blowing. 
Uh, and so, so when I, when I start to pray, the first thing I think about and meditate on is my union with Christ and the indwelling of the Spirit and this just astonishing um, reality that um, is made possible by God becoming a man, uh, taking on our nature so that um, we could partake of the divine nature. So realizing the presence of God um, and, you know, McIntyre says, and this is, I think, true for all of us, that, you know, sometimes that is very real to us. We, we have a strong uh, sense of that presence and special privilege, and sometimes not. Um, when it's not, when you when you feel distant, when you don't feel connected, you pray. Um, you cry out to God to awaken uh, uh, your sense of His presence in you. Honesty in prayer is essential. Um, so this is still the direction of the mind. Um, you have no secrets, anyway. Um, <laughs> and, you know, McIntyre makes the point that even if you're, even if you're frustrated or angry at God, deal with it, tell him. Um, you know, don't act like that's not the way you're really thinking, because he knows how you're thinking anyway. Uh, but in just doing that, you're, you're uh, there's a part of that that's simply confession, uh, and um, it's purifying. Um, and that's another point that McIntyre makes. We're enabled by being honest and being um, specific, we're enabled to remember and repent of sin. And certainly, uh, you know, that, that's, so, so we've talked about this uh, method of prayer, Matthew Henry's, um, um, and, and I, I need a structure so that I can, you know, not just flail around for a couple of hours. I mean, I need to... I, I, I don't always use a list, but I, I have used lists. Uh, but um, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, intercession, and petition. Um, sometimes, even though I've, I've, I've sort of organized it that way in my own mind, um, sin comes to mind and some other part of my prayer and um, so that's that's why that's really one of the necessity one of the, I think one of the reasons why you need this just quiet secluded time with God so that you can more clearly think and process um, and remember the sin that is in you that you need to be cleansed of and to repent of. Um, the direction of the mind, uh, uh, section three, when we draw near to God, we should come in faith. Uh, Ryle had a section in here that I wanted to read about this um, we we you know we tend we tend to put God in a box, our, the box of our little minds and the box of our finite world, um, and limit.
God. Uh, don't do that. I mean, to the extent that you can, um, because no miracle is impossible. Uh, and, uh, you know, in talking about this, he says, it's, it's, it's a, practically a miracle that even the words of your mouth can ascend to heaven. <laughs> um, but Ryle, in, in giving us examples of um, what prayer has accomplished, he says, prayer opened the Red Sea. Prayer brought water from the rock and bread from heaven. Prayer made the sun stand still. Prayer brought fire from the sky on Elijah's sacrifice. Prayer turned the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Prayer overthrew the army of Sennacherib. Well might Mary, Queen of Scots, say, I fear John Knox's prayers more than an army of 10,000 men. Prayer has healed the sick. Prayer has raised the dead. Prayer has pr procured the conversion of souls. Prayer, pains, and faith can do anything. Nothing seems impossible when a man has the spirit of adoption. Um, so, come in faith. Um, McIntyre says, our Lord confers on us his own rights and privileges as he makes intercession for us. The prayer of faith is the divinely appointed means by which the unutterable groanings of the Spirit who dwells within his people as in a temple are conveyed and committed to the exalted mediator who ever liveth to make intercession for us. Um, the engagement, um, uh, chapter 4, the worship. So he's got three, three chapters on engagement. One is uh, worship, uh, confession, and request. But in worship, he uh, commends, uh, first of all, the acknowledgement of daily mercies that seem to us common but are great. Um, the the 10,000 thousand daily mercies. Um, you know, just the, your ability to breathe and walk and think are mercies that not everyone has and enjoys. Um, and we just take them for granted. Um, just on my way in this morning, I was uh, reading a, a message about, you know, someone who is showing real memory issues. And it's alarming. It, you know, it's... Um, but, you know, you, you really are not... You're just not guaranteed the next second. None of us is. And so... Um, as, as, you know, as God is giving you life, uh, thank him for it and uh, don't waste it. Um, uh, worship should involve thanksgiving for redemption. And so he has a section where he encourages us to think back to our lives before Christ and how Christ worked in our lives and um, and how our lives are different and to thank God for it um, and to remember how the waste places of our life became fruitful and then contemplation of divine perfection of the one who died for our sins, who rose for our justification, and now awaits us at the right hand of God. 
there is so much to contemplate there to think uh, that a man could be sinless. Um, that he rose from the dead, conquered death, that, he, that, that there is a human being in heaven now who we have the promise of being with uh, and glorified bodies like his is glorified. Um, there's a lot to... Uh, to generate a worshipful heart in just thinking about these amazing realities. Um, the engagement, confession. Um, I think I mentioned this, be explicit. This is uh, turning the page. I, uh, I have done this evil, uh, is David's prayer in Psalm 51. It's not just kind of a general, oh, I know I'm a wicked man. Um, you know, there's a place for that, but you need to, to um, confess specifically. You know, First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, and the sense is that they're specific, not that we confess that we're sinners, but we confess our sins. Um, he gives a, a bit of a a, a warning here too that uh, we yield to the comforter. Uh, so you can get uh, like, I think the word is morose. You can dwell so much on your sin that you don't, you don't worship God. Um, and so it's important to confess, but uh, it's, we need to have an understanding and awareness that atonement has been made um, and rejoice in that. Uh, not, um, as he says, uh, you know, seek for a deeper humiliation constantly. Um, and then he has a section in here of why deadness of sin uh, a deadness of heart, um, and I, th you know, I think this gets back to the whole issue of uh, um, the, the secret of holiness. Um, if if you are if you are careless, uh, if you are uh, sort of insensitive to e to to your sin. Sins of omission, um, and you are not like uh, dealing with God in those specific things. Um, you're likely to backslide. There's a whole section in J.C. Ryle's uh, call to prayer. Uh, this these things are very closely connected. Um, your lack of diligence in prayer um, really opens the door for you to sin more. You're not walking in the Spirit. You're not living in a consciousness of the presence of God that comes to you by a, you know, a steady, uh, a diligent prayer life. And so you rationalize and justify sin and it just it, it becomes a lighter and lighter thing for you um, I, I, don't, I, I haven't done a whole lot of counseling uh, some you know um, but it is in it's just I haven't seen a case yet where the the problems that the person was having weren't accompanied by a lack of diligence in prayer. Uh, 
Um, chapter 6 is uh, the engagement, uh, the third section. Um, talk, and he talks about really what to pray for. Um, and, and, and so he mentions, you know, Matthew 21. I'm going to read some of these. Let's see if I can find my notes. Matthew 21, 22. Um, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Um, It's a lot like Matthew 17, 20, which says, um, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Um, and then um, John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask for what you desire, for what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Those are amazing promises um, that are, you know, grossly abused. Um, and so, this section uh, in his essay. Um, Really, the, the, the issue is when, in what context and, you know, when, are, when, are, when is this true? Like, this isn't like blanket, yeah, just, you know, pray for whatever you want and bam, you'll have it. It's not, you know, like God is some sort of genie. Um, but, it, it, you know, if you have, as he says, a disposition conformed to Christ... Um, and he elaborates on several points um, that your prayers are subject to the divine will and restrained within the interest of Christ and instructed in the truth and energized by the Spirit interwoven with love and mercy accompanied with obedience um, and so earnest that denial will not be accepted. Uh, you know, if, if those things are true about your prayers, um, then these promises apply. Uh, some of the some of the commentary on these passages was so rich. Um, I wanted to share some of that with you. Um, Matthew Henry, uh, and speaking of, of Matthew 21, 22, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive, um, he said, um, faith is the soul, prayer is the body. Both together make a complete man for any service. Faith, if it be right, will excite prayer, and prayer is not right if it does not spring from faith. This is the condition of our receiving. We must ask in prayer, believing. The requests of prayer shall not be denied. The expectations of faith shall not be frustrated. We have many promises to this purport from the mouth of our Lord Jesus, and all to encourage faith. The, so this is, faith is the principal grace and prayer, the principal duty of a Christian. Um, so if you're, if, you're, if you're diligent in prayer, if you are in communion with God uh, uh, regularly, um, this is going to inform and affect the kinds of things that you pray about. And they're going to be less about yourself and your sometimes petty little things uh, and more about the glory of God and the 
conversion of souls and the um, The, the, the blessings of faithfulness. Um, there's another commentator on this Matthew passage. R.T. France says, It is important to observe here that it is not the amount of faith which brings the impossible within reach, but the power of God, which is available even to the smallest faith. Moreover, for Matthew, the type of faith required always involves commitment to Jesus and obedience to his commands, which must therefore always include praying, thy will be done. Um, he goes on to say, much is not accomplished for the kingdom because we simply do not believe God will adequately empower us or else because we undertake various activities in our own strength rather than God's. Yet, we must recognize the limitations of this promise in light of other scriptures and not use it to foist a guilt trip on ourselves or others when faith does not eliminate every calamity from our lives. Um, and then the last one on John. Uh, John 15, 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Well, your desires will be given to you by God if that's what you're, if you're abiding in his word. It's not that these are your desires, but they're the desires that have been put in you by God that conform to God. Um, and uh, let's see, who was this? This was D.A. Carson. Um, uh, to cast it in terms of prayer, such a truly obedient believer proves effective in prayer since all he or she asks for conforms to the will of God. Ugh, we got four minutes. Um, Um, this is chapter 6, looking at section 3, Reasons Why We Must Pray. Um, by prayer, our continued and humble dependence upon the grace of God is secured. Um, and, and we, you know, the, 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 your, your approach to God in prayer is itself an expression of your dependence. It's good for you to do it for that reason, so that you will remember uh, and be mindful of your dependence. Um, it, it's a practice that you need for the rest of the day. Uh, you know, if you don't do this you know, in your quiet time with God, you're not going to live that way the rest of the day. You, you need to, you need to um, be reminded of your, you need to remind yourself of your dependence on God. Um, why we must pray, the Lord desires to have much communion, much, to have us much in communion with himself. This really was sort of the topic last week, um, and it is a really, to, for me, a powerful motivation to pray. The Lord desires it of me. Um, it is a sweet-smelling aroma to him for, for me, for us to pray. Um, he delights in our prayers. Um, and then Hebrews 12, for, you know, he endured the cross for the joy set before him, which was the redemption of us. Um, and, and, you know, so part of that 
last week, you know, that my mindset often when I pray is, is like, I'm just trying to hold on to God so that I can uh, persevere to the end. You know, it's, 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 it tends to be a very uh, I hate to use the word, but it's true. Selfish, in a way, motive. Like I need it. <laughs> Persevere to the end of this life. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I need it. It's. I mean, it, it, it's. Um, It's good for me to pray, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's good for me. And, but it's also pleasing to God, you know, and that should be a motivation for you to pray. Um, he says, much, very much has often been accomplished in us before we are fitted to employ worthily the gifts we covet. Um, and so by prayer, we are fitted for the things that we're praying for um, and equipped to receive them when they come and taught to be patient and waiting. Uh, one of the testimonies in here was uh, uh, George Mueller recounted something that he had prayed about for 29 years before it was given to him. Um, and the, f the fourth one here... Um, in prayer, um, self is forgotten. And it's not entirely forgotten, but that you should, your focus should move from, it should not be entirely like your petitions. It's not, it's not wrong to petition, but don't make that the whole content of your <laughs> prayer time. You know, I need this, I need that, I need this. Um, well, we're done. We're we're at the end of our time. The the the, the there's the, the the last two chapters in a sense are um, a couple of the richest things here. Uh, but chapter seven, the the hidden riches of the secret place, uh, he he really ties it back to where we we began, which is uh, that the. Um, the, the, the blessing, the, the benefit, the, the um, largely the good that comes to you from prayer is that uh, you grow in holiness. Communion with God is the condition of spiritual growth. The habit of prayerfulness produces a singular serenity of spirit those who continually exercise themselves in prayer are taught to rule their lives according to the will of God. And through the acceptance of the will of God for us, we are led out into richer influence and wider usefulness. Um, anyway, I hope you'll pray more. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're uh, grateful for... Um, just this amazing privilege to be able to speak to you and to cry out to you and to praise you and um, just to have fellowship with you. It is an amazing grace and um, we experience it um, uh, deeply in uh, our uh, prayer life of, of communion with you. And so we just thank you for the privilege and the blessing of prayer and um, your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.